Hello, uh, good evening, uh, Aditi here, and we have today Vidhi with us. Uh, Vidhi is uh, Vidhi and Manisha, the one of the people whom whom we met early in our uh, homeschooling, unschooling, whatever unlearning journey. And since then, been following. Uh, although uh, they operate from Udaipur, which is north part of India, and we are here in south part of India. There is a lot more. Um, I, I think uh, I have have Vidhi apart from uh, you know Shikshantar and unlearning or, or whatever unschooling their uh, their daughter and working in various things like families learning together and different initiatives. I I will leave it to the Vidhi to share that uh, more in detail. Before we start, uh, I just want to share one video from. Shikshanta. Uh, yeah, Ratnish is confirming. We are live on Facebook. Just to give you an idea. So just a little glimpses of what what all is possible when you talk about community, when you talk about unlearning, when you talk about uh, you know questioning this whole uh, education system. And uh, before Vidhi starts, uh, some of the questions which come uh, across are you know with what's the difference between homeschooling, unschooling, open learning, free schooling. Uh, I, 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 we would say that you know there are different spectrum and and there are lots lot more choices than than just one one or whatever one area which you call is the schooling there are there are many more options and today we we'll, we we'll hear from Vidhi what are the different options which they have created for themselves for their own daughter as well as for the people around um, um, in Udaipur as well as throughout the country. So, uh, yeah, uh, over to you, uh, Vidhi. And I think it's, yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, yes. Okay, great. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, the video of Shikshantar brought back lots of memories to me because <laughs> we made this film during the lockdown and a lot of the things it started many, many years ago, were are very live with me right now. So I'm happy to watch this video and, uh, and you know, spend some time talking to you guys about our work, our life. So I'm very happy. Thank you, Aditi, for inviting me here. And um, as, um, as a parent, as a learning activist, uh, I'd like to, you know, start by sharing uh, that... Uh, Spaces like Arohi give us a lot of courage, hope, and uh, inspiration also. And uh, we have a lot of common friends in our network. So when you come to share your, you know, life with friends, it gives you more strength. So um, let me start with uh, just sharing a little bit about Shikshantar and what it means and why we started Shikshantar. Uh, so. Um, you know, like any other child growing up in India, I also grew up going to many, many different schools and many different parts of the country. And um, uh, I traveled also as a child because my father was on a transferable job. So I had the privilege of uh, going to all kinds of schools. I, I, I think in 
12 years of my school education, I went to nine different schools and I experienced schools of all shapes, sizes, all kinds of structures. And I always had lots of questions about my own schooling. And uh, I used to, uh, you know, wonder why I go to school. Why can't I do other things that make me more happy? Uh, then um, I went to college and more questions about education started in my mind. And I was always, you know, keen to spend more time doing practical things, things with my hands, things that were exciting for me. And that really made me question why we are always made to go to schools to learn things that make no sense in our lives. Why we are always put in a classroom with just people of our own age group who we, you know, either connect with very deeply or only have to compete with. So that really made me very, un, you know, uneasy and nervous. And um, so I was very fortunate that then um, about 22 years ago, I met Manish. And Manish had grown up in the US and he had spent a lot of time in many different countries as a uh, educational consultant. And he had the experience of you know, education systems all over the world. And I had worked with children with special needs and I had worked with many different funding agencies and I had seen the whole development game and I had a lot of questions about how all these things, you know, work. So when we met, we actually decided that we would leave all the work that we were doing in mainstream education behind and start something very alternative. And, uh, and we had... We had decided that we would do it because we were deeply connected with our own questions about our own life. And uh, so 22 years ago, both me and Manish started a life movement, which we actually see as a continuation of the freedom struggle also. We believe that, you know, a lot of the questions that people going to today's education system should be asking or questions that were being asked during the freedom struggle about, you know, what kind of a life we would have once the British leave, what kind of education systems we would have, what kind of governance systems we would have, how we would be, you know, trying to deeply, more deeply connect with nature, our own life, our own lifestyle. So questions about Swaraj. So we um, uh, started Shikshantar because we felt that people need to really start asking questions about how they want to live their life and reclaim their own learning. And so Shikshantar is actually um, a movement that was started to rethink our lifestyles and to also reclaim our own learning spaces because today schools have taken over most of our life. Uh, we go to 12 years of school and college. And so we're basically put into the rat race at a very early age. And we want people to start thinking outside that rat race because nobody's really happy in that rat race. So Shikshantar was started with the dream to create something very alternative. And uh, when we started Shikshantar, before we started Shikshantar, which is in Udaipur, both me and Manish had made a very conscious decision that we would never care, send our kids to school. And that this would be a space for free learning where kids could actually come and learn the things that they really find, uh, or the things that they're really passionate about. And uh, things that really connect them to their own local communities rather than something that's, you know, detaching them for their, from their real life, actually. So uh, when we started Shikshantar 22 years ago, this was in Udaipur, we started working on a process called Udaipur as a learning city to actually uh, understand what real learning means. You know, we had actually also gone through mainstream education and mainstream college and we really understood we realized that we had a lot of bullshit in our heads about what this on the web about what success is about what a good life is what what we want to do in our lives actually because you know you realize that in the first maybe 15 years of your life you know in schools and colleges you're actually never even asked what you like to do you're only told what to do so to be able to start you know, imagining new possibilities, we need to actually unlearn a lot of the bullshit that's forced into our heads through schooling, through college, through media, through lots of, you know, a lot of things that, that happen in the family also. So that really starts, so that you can start redefining what education is, what a good life is, what success is, and uh, what our relationship 
with all these things is because uh, today's success has been defined very narrowly, development has been defined very narrowly, and we are forced to go into that. So uh, one beautiful thing that Manish says is that, you know, we have today, we have 50 brands of toothpaste, but one model of education that everyone has to go through. So why can't we actually think of many, many different ways of education and learning and actually explore the different possibilities that exist? I mean, if there are 16 people here in this uh, webinar, there have to be 16 different ways of learning, 16 different models of learning. And we need to create spaces for those rather than saying that everyone has to fit into that cookie cutter model of education, which makes you all look the same, think the same, and unfortunately kills your creativity by the age of 10 or 15. So Shikshantar was created for people who hate going to school, for people who don't want to go to school, and for people who want, believe that learning is actually far more important and that learning can happen outside school. So I have an 18 year old daughter, Kanku, and uh, she has never been to school. We've uh, very consciously decided that we would try to live a life with her because schools do a very big damage is that actually creates a big gap between the child's life and the adult's life and the family life. So we were very conscious that we wanted to grow up with our child rather than sending her to a different place to learn where we actually can't even appreciate her strengths, her beauty, her gifts. And she can also not appreciate our gifts and our beauty. So we wanted to create a space where people of different generations come together. So Shikshantar has always been a space for intergenerational learning where people of many different generations come together and learn together. You may have a five-year-old together with a 10-year-old with a 90-year-old doing different things. And we believe that true learning, natural learning happens when people are put in intergenerationally, when people are together, when people of different ages are together. So, uh, you know, the whole idea of Shikshantar is that you come and explore different ways of learning, be it through your body, be it through art, be it through culture, uh, music, be it through farming, be it through filmmaking, and things that are really missing in our lives today, actually. When you ask a child what they want to learn, they actually can't think about it because, you know, they've never even been able, allowed to think outside the box. So we are a crazy space. Shikshantar is a crazy space. And we started this as an invitation for all crazy people like us, for people who really believe that you know, the local knowledge systems that we have outside also need to be brought into our lives and that we need to live more community-based lives rather than very disconnected lives like the kind of lives we're living today. And uh, Shikshantar has been running for 21 years and um, we worked with people of all ages and a lot of young people. And uh, I'm very proud to say that I've helped a lot of people walk out of school and college because I believe that, you know, their learning and their life was getting very clamped up in school and they hated going to school like I hated going to school. I wish I had that opportunity when I was growing up. But also taking, taking the step ahead, it's not just walking out of something, but creating something beautiful for your life. And I think that creation of something beautiful in your life starts when you start asking questions about your own life, about your food, about how to heal yourself about how to create your own learning space, about how to create your own house, about how to think about economy, about all these things. And so the deepest questions of learning actually have to come from your own life. And uh, so Shikshantar is a life movement because we ask questions about how we want to live our life. Do we really feel that television is a good thing in our lives or can we do more creative things if we don't have televisions in our life? So when my daughter was growing up, she was very small. We made a lot of very conscious decisions because we felt that for us, spending time, learning together, doing creative things was much more important than just, you know, sending our kids away somewhere else and doing something else. So we actually started doing a lot of projects that really excited us. And we realized that our daughter started enjoying doing those things also. And so the first few years of Shikshantar's growth were actually trying to create our own community, our our own little village. I mean, I, I'm sure you've heard this quote, but there's a beautiful African proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child. So actually coming back to a new city and creating that village for ourselves was the most beautiful part of 
our daughter's life with us because we actually went and found a whole new range of creative people around us and people who really we, we found were very valuable in our own growing up process, different artists, different farmers, different healers, different people with cooking skills. And we said, let's invite all these amazing people into our community and create a little learning um, uh, web for ourselves because we had grown up doing just the things that you know we were told to do. But when you expose a child to many different possibilities, they actually can make some choices, uh, choices of what they like to do, what they don't like to do. And so Shikshantar is a space for people of all ages. We do crazy things from morning to evening. We eat together, we cook together. And we also try to challenge ourselves together because today education system challenges you only in the form of exams or tests. But actually the real challenges in life start when you start working on projects that me uh, mean something to you, that are real and uh, so we try to create projects together and work on real questions of life. And uh, so when we started unschooling our daughter, I was, when my daughter was, you know, really just born, I remember we knew a handful of families who were not sending their kids to school. And uh, so we started this whole network of unschoolers and homeschoolers called Families Learning Together. And some of our friends are here also who were a part of that because we wanted that we should have many different networks that we are all a part of. And so families learning together, when we started, we, had, we knew about 50 or 60 families who were homeschooling their kids. But now we know more than 10,000 families in the country who are not sending their kids to school and actually trust the relationship that they have with their children, the learning relationship, the relationship of how they want to actually see their kids creating different kinds of alternatives. And uh, so Udaipur as a learning city is a process that we started in Udaipur to find the wealth of learning opportunities that exist in the cities that we live in. Because most people, you know, when we moved to Udaipur said, oh, Udaipur is a bad city. I mean, there's no learning opportunities for people. You need to go to big cities like Mumbai and Delhi to be able to create learning opportunities for your kids. And we said, actually, the real learning is with these amazing people who live around us. We don't have to dream big dreams of going out we need to expose our kids to the beautiful things that are happening around us. And if they choose to go out, that's fine too. I mean, we don't have, we're not blocking our kids in what they want to learn, but we as parents need to expose them and do things with them as creative as we can be with our kids. So Shikshantar has been a movement to encourage people of all ages to go crazy in learning, to do things that we really like. And uh, so Shikshantar has many networks that we work through. Udaipur as a learning city is one, which is based in Udaipur. And then there's a Families Learning Together Network, which is a family of, uh, network of unschoolers, homeschoolers all over the country, uh, all over the world. Actually, we have families from all over the world who were a part of it. And then there's this network, uh, which we call the Learning Societies Network. I think uh, we've organized um, gatherings even in Bangalore, but this is people who are thinking very alternative outside the mainstream education system and are thinking about alternatives to this mainstream model of education, asked how to live on the land, how to deeply connect with nature. And um, so the Learning Societies Network is basically, you know, people from all different walks of life coming, spending time together, questions, raising questions about their own life and creating stronger bonds because we all need community and what we're doing so uh, we've been organizing these unconferences worldwide and we've recently had the last unconference like five ten days before the lockdown happened in uh, a place in Sadar Sher. and uh, so we organize get-togethers workshops and lot, lots of different dialogues around learning societies Swaraj University was also started ten years ago so that's also part of Shikshantar and uh, the whole idea of Swaraj University was how do people create their own curriculum. And university is very narrowly defined today, you know. But the whole beauty of Swaraj University is that people who join Swaraj University join for two years and are called Kojis, seekers, and they design their own curriculum for the two years that they're there. So there's no two Kojis who have the same curriculum. And these Kojis actually spend two years, a lot of time on reflecting on their own life, 
on what's going on in their neighborhoods and their communities and actually get time to spend a lot of time on their own entrepreneurship skills because today's education system is only creating job beggars, right? Education equals to going and looking for a job, but we don't believe in job beggars. We believe that we need to create job creators. So Swaraj University has also helped us to find you know, very interesting people all over the country who could help us create jobs rather than just running aimlessly after a job, doing a job, a nine to five job, and then hating that nine to five job. So uh, we've been able to do lots of exciting things. I can talk more in detail as questions get addressed uh, also. Swaraj University has also been running for 10 years. And um, yeah, so there's lots of different networks we work through, but I mean, I talk too much about Shikshanta, but I just would like to, I don't know how much time I have Aditi, but I would like to please share some of the highlights of my unschooling journey with my daughter, because my daughter is 18 and we've had the most beautiful uh, experiences growing up together. Uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, are you homeschooling your daughter? Are you unschooling your daughter? And I say, actually, I'm doing nothing like that. I'm just very happy to grow up with my daughter. Because for me, the thought of sending my child to school means I have to wake up at six in the morning, make a tiffin for her, then send her up, pack her up, send her to school, come pick her up, then make lunch. And I feel that this for me is not a very natural or happy process. For me, it's really beautiful that we do things together and learn together and appreciate each other's gifts together. And for me, my daughter has been my biggest guru, actually, because she's been you know, around us. And she's actually helped us unlearn a lot of our uh, things that we, both me and Manish, have, you know, had while we were growing up. So she really, you know, gives us a reality check also at the time, points of time where we say, oh yeah, fine, Kanku, you're right. We never have been thought of it. The new perspective on everything we've done. She's a beautiful artist. She does a lot of painting. Uh, she's a very good musician. And... Uh, she um, spends a lot of time in nature. While she was growing up, she used to do a volunteering at many small, many places. She used to, you know, go to animal shelters. She used to go and work in cafes. Uh, she used to spend most of her time in the Sabji Mandi with the vegetable uh, vendors. She was a filmmaker. She started making films at a very early age. And she's a very good jewelry designer. So she does a lot of creative things. And uh, she's always been there as a great support in our house because she enjoys cooking. So she got me and my husband into cooking also. So we love cooking together as a family. And um, yeah, so I, it's been a beautiful journey actually. And we, for once as parents, never felt this pressure that, you know, we need to work on, you know, her, her curriculum and we need to get textbooks for her. We've never felt that pressure because for us, learning has been a very spontaneous process. You know, she's, Actually, when you know that your child is, you know, uh, getting exposed to so many things, you realize that your child actually starts asking you a lot of questions about life. And a lot of learning happens through those questions of life. So my daughter till the age of 13 didn't know how to read and write at all. And we never pushed her to read and write. And we felt that, you know, if she feels a need to read and write, she'll tell us sometime. And uh, at the age of 13, we suddenly realized that she was operating YouTube on her own and looking for makeup videos. So she had somehow managed to figure it out herself. And for that, of course, she needed a little bit of reading and writing, but she would ask us for things that she, you know, really found were meaningful. So you realize that actually, when a child has a purpose for learning, when they want to learn something, they learn it very fast. And so that's where Khao Kanku started a bit of reading and writing. I wouldn't say she's a very good reader. She enjoys reading a lot, but you know, for her needs, she knows how to get to it. And um, she's a very good. Uh, she's very good with people of all ages. She's very social, and I believe that you know, when she's around, a lot of people, you know, uh, you know, get excited about her because I feel that. One thing that most people, you know, used to question us when we were, you know, when Kanku was growing up, oh, your child is going to be an antisocial. She won't be, have any friends. She'll be, you know, just sitting at home all day and she won't know how to socialize with people. But I re know, realized that my daughter is actually much more social than any of the other kids I've come across because she spends time with people of all ages. She 
at the age of eight or nine was speaking more than four languages, which she had picked up on her own. So being around people, by spending time with people, you learn so many more things. Uh, you cannot learn those things through textbooks because textbooks are only preparing you for an exam. I don't remember anything that I learned from a textbook, actually. So uh, for real life, you need to actually go deeper into things and experience them practically. And I think that's where her learning strength has been. And she has spent a lot of time. Uh, her early age, we were very, very fortunate that uh, both Manisha's grandparents grew up with, were with us. So she has actually grown up serving our old grandparents a lot. And she saw that, you know, there is a great value in having old people around us also. And she uh, actually, well, for me, when somebody asks me, you know, what, what is it that really excites you about your whole unschooling process and why, uh, you know, all this that you've been doing, I, just, I, I feel that my daughter is at least much more sensitive than a lot of the kids around her. I don't want to compare them, but I feel that for me, it's very important that my daughter is sensitive and caring and a good human being. And I feel that that can happen anywhere. You don't need to go to school. I mean, actually, schools have, don't even give you time to think about what you want to become as a human being. And for us, it's really important when Kanku can deeply connect with animals, with birds, with plants, and she can actually, she can talk to them also. So for us, that's really important. And the confidence when you can start doing things on your own is much stronger than the confidence that you get by just learning from a textbook. So our journey has been beautiful so far and we've spent a lot of time traveling together as a family also because I know that most kids who go to school don't get time to travel. All the dates of family events are decided on when kids have vacations. But for us, it's been beautiful because you know, we don't have to think about vacation. Our life is so beautiful. We travel together, we do things together. And I feel that the biggest blessing is that parents, as parents, we get to time, get to spend time with our kids. So, yeah, I don't know, Aditi, how much more? I mean, I've already spoken for <laughs> 20, 30 minutes, but I would love more questions, more. Yeah. 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 Maybe people can either type, uh, people who are there with us uh, today, you can type your question in chat window or can come on mic sure. while either you're typing and coming on mic uh, with a few things if you want you can also talk about the gap year because that's mm -hmm. something <clears throat> even in the lockdown online uh, uh, happened and then and then you're trying to support people who wants to walk out and uh, mm -hmm. create their own life at any age so yeah, yeah. So you want me to talk about gap year right now? Yeah, sure. the, by the people either are typing uh, uh, the questions or somebody wants to come on mic and come and have interaction with. You. Sure, sure, sure. So I would just um, uh, say that you know, um, yeah. I mean, I'll start with this uh, thing that we did about ten years ago, twelve years ago actually. Uh, we ran a campaign. 12 years ago called Healing Ourselves from the Diploma Disease, which is a campaign that we ran to basically demystify this whole, you know, this, this craze about degrees and certificates and, you know, how we just need to run after these to be able to make a good life. Actually, uh, degrees and, de and diplomas and certificates are actually the most artificial way of appreciating a person's gifts. So we ran a worldwide campaign and in that, we actually came across a lot of people who said that, yeah, we don't believe that degrees are a good measure of anything. So during that campaign, we met people who said that we would like to meet interesting people who are creative, passionate, who, who have many skills. Today, the problem with today's education system is that it prepares you only for one line. If you want to become a doctor, you become a doctor. If you want to become a engineer, you become an engineer. We feel that you have to have a multi-talented um, exposure. You need to do many, many different things while growing up. So, um, you know, and then we were working very closely with employers who were giving people jobs. And they said, actually, we prefer to have people who don't have degrees because they are more creative. They're doing a lot more questioning in their lives. So, we said that how are the ways in which we can encourage people to think outside this degree game, this whole 
you know, I'm sorry to use a bad word, the bullshit of degrees and diplomas and stuff. So we uh, said that, look, homeschooling is one aspect. A lot of parents do homeschooling, a lot of parents do unschooling. But we said, we said, look, for us, it's really important that people do experimentation wherever they are. They don't have to, you know, completely say that schooling is wrong or they don't have to completely leave the system or walk out completely. I mean, I would encourage people to do that, but we have to give many people many different alternatives. So one of the alternatives that we are working on and been working on and supporting a lot of young people with is this whole idea of taking a gap year. A gap year is a year on, basically. We don't say you're taking a year off, but you're taking a year on. So at any point of your, uh, you know, uh, school or maybe after maybe class eight or nine or at after college, uh, we encourage um, people to take, uh, you know, a gap, one year gap, because one year is a good amount of time for yourself, for t people to explore what the deep questions of their life are, what they would like to learn and who they would want to learn from. And it's not... I mean, we're not saying that in your gap year, you decide what you want to do 10 years from now. We cannot do that today. We have to really focus on building things that we are passionate about right now. So the gap year is something that we've been working on and we've been supporting a lot of young people to take gap years. We work with schools, we work with um, employees and, you know, connect people with the right kind of learning resources. So if I would say, if I were to take a gap year and am I, I'm interested in natural dyeing, I would explore natural dyeing. And I would, I would be able to, you know, go and spend time with people who are practically doing it. If I'm interested in farming, I should go and spend some time uh, with uh, farmers. So this is a one year of experience where you can travel, where you can learn different skills, where you can spend time with yourself. And break this monotony actually today schools have created a very monotonous life so we also need time to reflect think about what where life is and spend time with older people spend time with younger people spend time in nature so a gap year is a pro uh, we've been doing this gap year um, uh, campaign for a long time and just uh, last month and especially during the lockdown we felt that a lot of people have a lot of time at home and uh, you know, a lot of what's happening is that kids, even though they're at home, they're sitting in front of the computer, just doing online, um, you know, classes from seven to uh, four, basically sitting in front of a screen, again, doing that same damn curriculum that doesn't even help you in your life. So we help young people to actually think of deeper questions of their life, things that they're passionate about and use that one year. So starting now, even if we start thinking about taking one gap year, there is so much we can explore, you know. Being at home, you can do it. By going out in your community, you can do it. Uh, there is a lot of very interesting things that are going on online. So connect with those and do it. So this gap year submit we just started and uh, it's, it was really good to hear stories of people who took gap years. And we are trying to support young people to take this gap year. Uh, even, you know, if you want to start taking thinking about it right now. And we've had great people like, you know, Kiran Sethi and these people who, who encouraged schools are actually encouraging kids to take gap years because they feel that when the students come back after a gap year, they're much, much more experienced. They have much, much more ideas. They have so much, much more creativity. So how do we work with different kinds of people to encourage a gap year? And uh, Gap years are very common in the US. I don't know if you're aware of that, but you know, a lot of the Ivy League colleges in the US are actually making it mandatory that before a college year or before joining college, a person should have a gap year because your real learning happens when you're taking a gap year, not when you're doing just 12 years of schooling. So we have a lot of gap year programs coming to India to learn also. So we're trying to promote this whole concept of gap year and it's really beautiful so far. So I would also think if you want to you know, know more about it, I'll be happy to connect you with more people. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, and, and Vidya, I want to add that gap year, not only for the college goers, uh, Everyone. There, there are a number of children who come to Arohi and they just take say, either a few months or a year break from their, uh, their regular schooling. Mm -hmm. And when, and if they want to go back, they also go back to the schooling and, but the difference, what you were talking about, there are much more 
explored they 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 have, have they've got many more things because they got that freedom of not, not freedom in that sense but mm. uh, you know break from whatever their monotony and and things were doing so it's so it, it it's it's quite quite amazing to see that how the moment you take away uh, take them out of that system they 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 blossom and and they are and then they are ready to next step of, mm-hmm. in their life so archana has a, a question uh, vidhi that how did you manage to answer people who told that your child will be anti social if she mm-hmm. doesn't attend school mm-hmm. and that then the second question about the travels so if you want to just take this one first and then we can take more questions yeah i'll just what was the other question uh, other than she saying as a family we don't travel much that will that affect child in any way mm-hmm. okay yeah so um cool the socialization question really excites me because, <laughs> uh, when i think about my own growing up also uh, you know i i used to always find it very irritating that i was you know always put uh, in a classroom with people of only my own age all the time and i used to actually find it very frustrating because you know you have a 7 year old on this side and a 7 year old this side and you're told that you're you know learning all the time and your only interaction with people of different ages is when you step out or go home so uh, the so, so whole idea of socialization is actually you know uh, you know you have to really deeply ask is socialization happening in schools is it is it socialization i don't even think it's socialization because um, socialization is not that you actually just uh, make friends uh, with people of your own age you can make friends with people of your own age but that's not real socialization and uh, to be very honest today most kids who come out of schools are lacking in socialization skills they're scared of talking to people they're scared because you know when you're um, made to rote memorize things when your whole expression your own expression your whole way of you know communicating with people gets killed by the age of 10 15 you lose a lot of confidence and uh, so i feel when you don't speak your own language i mean schools today don't let you socialize or even communicate in your own mother tongue you're made to learn um, a foreign language not a foreign language but a language that may not be your own uh, favorite language and then you're made to learn english so your confidence has been killed pretty much at a very early age and your socialization is actually when you're spending time with people outside doing real things you cannot socialize on a textbook you socialize when you do things with people so uh, i uh, when people told me that oh your ch- daughter is you know going to be an anti socialized to say well go see where she is and uh, you know they would be shocked to see that my daughter was never shy to go to a neighbor's house she could go and spend time in a neighbor's house go and eat food with people she would spend time with people of all backgrounds uh, people of all ages all species i mean she could be spend time with a cat as well as a cow as well as so she never had this fear of socializing in fact uh, she was more curious asking questions and i as a parent used to sometimes feel yaar ye kabhi bhi kuch bhi kisi ko bhi pooch leti hai logo ko kya lagta hoga but actually she had confidence and that confidence that you can talk to people of all ages be in different kinds of backgrounds my daughter used to spend time in a village in the city and she's traveled extensively and i felt that she could actually socialize or make friends wherever she went she never had a problem in making friends and she is doing that even now while i used to you know i'm not comparing again but when i meet friends uh, you know a lot of kankus friends who go to school they don't they don't have that social skill in fact even if you ask them a question they're quiet for half an hour because they don't know how to answer and more of mo- most of their questions you know uh, their answers or their way of socializing is actually coming from somewhere else it's not authentic so i believe that we need to create spaces where children can authentically uh, socialize they don't need to socialize over only textbooks but things that really make sense to them so my daughter used to spend a lot of time in the halwai ki dukan because she used to learn new recipes from them and she used to you know if somebody asks uh, you know if i somebody comes to shikshantar or somebody comes to our house if you want to find that place all you have to say is kanku ka ghar bata do everyone in the neighborhood knows her 
so i feel that that social if that kind of socialization is happening then you don't need to convince anyone right and the other thing is that you know people will always ask you questions about this socialization or how much your daughter is learning so as parents as um you know people in extended you have to actually start trusting that your child can you know knows how to handle these situations she doesn't have to be answerable to anyone i think that's the biggest mistake we make is that you know kids i can i don't want to compare my child with any other child that's the most criminal thing i can do every child is beautiful every child has their own way of learning so we need to give a child a space to explore that i when somebody says that maybe your child is not learning enough i was like maybe she's learning the way she wants to learn and as parents we can create opportunities for that but i don't want i'm not answerable to you know everyone about where her learning is going and how she is learning see her see how what kinds of things she is doing uh, she she can be very anti social if she starts realizing that people are trying to test her which is fair i mean i don't want to be questioned or tested all the time and that's great so you know socialization also happens at different levels in many different ways and we have to appreciate that uh, so i don't know if that helps your answers your question if she's <laughs> yeah uh, hi archana is she there archana yeah are you, I, are you there yeah I, and the second question she is asking is um, as a family we don't travel much will that affect the child uh no, traveling is you know i don't know if it's traveling worldwide or traveling even in your own neighborhood if you spend time you learn so many things kids learn so much more um you know by just being around different people by you know people of different backgrounds so traveling happens sometimes unfortunately today what's happened is that schools don't even if kids were traveling uh today's uh structured life doesn't allow for um um you know uh, traveling or spending time with people outside so traveling is a choice i mean i wouldn't uh, i cannot force anyone to travel but i enjoy traveling my daughter enjoys traveling uh, maybe it's not possible for everyone to travel so the child will find opportunities for you know different kinds of things that they want to do around their communities i would definitely say that you don't have to travel far but a child should go to different kinds of learning ecosystems if a child can spend some time in a village that's also traveling it's not like you need to go very far to travel you can go traveling around your place and we should always be open to doing those kinds of things with our kids and um, if you have time if you can travel i think that's also good because you learn so many things that a textbook can never uh, teach you So Achna is saying she can't unmute because there's a lot of noise in the background. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. So Vatsa uh, and I think no, no, sorry. Vatsa is asking what fields do not need degrees. That's interesting question, uh, Vidhi. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, depends on what how you define the fields. I mean. Uh, so basically as you know when we're talking about a degree uh, a degree is something that's always preparing you for a job in the mainstream you know so if you want to become an engineer you're going to become a part of the mainstream if you want to become a doctor you have to become a part of the mainstream uh, so i always say that you know people who want to become doctors people who want to become engineers the mainstream way must do it but actually there are many many alternatives to that mainstream also there are many streams you know why do you want to become a doctor you can become a doctor for that you need maybe 5 years or 10 years of rigorous education or schooling or whatever but you could also think of very alternative ways of uh, healing so there are so many things like ayurved so many things like um, you know homeopathy that don't require that kind of a degree uh, you could think of uh, architecture could be you know maybe there are some colleges of architecture that need you know a formal degree but a lot of um, you know eco architecture a lot of alternative ways of looking at architecture don't need it and i believe me today people are looking more for 
people who are creative in alternative ways of doing things. People are fed up of doctors and engineers. They want creative uh, people doing these things. So degrees is something that, I mean, I think the whole idea of degree is something that we have to first work out in our own heads. You know, why do we need a degree, first of all? If we are clear that a degree is actually nothing, a degree says nothing about, um, what's your name? Um, Batsa. Batsa. A degree means nothing to, uh, because everyone, if I have a degree and you have a degree in uh, BSc and whatever, chemistry, both our degrees look the same. But what's more important is how we understand chemistry, what are the things that really we can make, how we can make a life out of chemistry. So what are the creative ways of doing chemistry? That's more important. So uh, when we tell people that, you know, don't run around a degree, we're not saying that, okay, you shouldn't have any way of expressing. You can create a good portfolio for yourself. And a portfolio is much more, much, much more illustrative of your life experiences. And a lot of colleges in the US and in India now are saying that we don't care about a degree, but if you have a good portfolio, which talks about your real learning experiences, uh, that's more valuable. And uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, organizations, a lot of uh, um, even uh, companies are saying that a degree is not so important as uh, a, a strong skill base, a strong uh, idea of so. I mean, if you want to be a part of the total mainstream and then, you know, do it the, that way, then, of course, maybe a degree is important. But if you want to do something where you feel there is peace, where there is happiness, then there are many, many different alternative ways of looking at it and many, many different professions yeah. uh, of doing it. Yeah. And to add to, I don't think Vidhi or uh, myself has any degree in the education uh, yeah. field and then we have been working extensively yeah. with the so, somebody is saying something. Srinivasan. Yeah. Um, Jay and both are asking the question. What's are you speaking? Yeah, your voice is uh, breaking. You want to try again? Yes. Sure. Okay, is it audible? No. Much yeah. better, yeah. 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 Is it much better? Okay. So, uh, as you were referring to, you no, know, my question was uh, about those uh, fields of, uh, you know, where uh, children can, you know, what are those fields where you don't require degrees? But, um, you know, as you say, mainstream. Mainstream is the professional degrees, right? That you are referring to, like doctors, mm -hmm. engineers, lawyers, isn't it? I mean, if I'm right. Yeah. So, uh, what could be the other uh, fields? Yeah, I mean, can you just name a few of the other professions and uh, how could we reach out to these employers if children have some interest in these particular fields and, uh, you know, they want to gain something like an apprenticeship or an internship in these, uh, with these organizations or employers, which would give them, um, which would help them to improve their skills? Mm hmm so, I mean, we yes. have a list of more than 500, 800 organizations all over the country from many different backgrounds. There are people who are working in digital media. There are people who are working on healing, health, people who are working on farming, people who are working on filmmaking. And I mean, we really want that more and more people go through these people and learn from these people because these are people who don't want degrees. And they actually are big advocates for, you know, really learning practically, doing internships, mentorships. So I'm happy to connect you with uh, those. And as I said, you know, fields, you could become a, you know, if you really want to become a doctor by being, having a degree, you can take a degree. It's just a piece of paper. You need to give a national open school exam and you can get that degree. But you don't have to necessarily put your child through, you know, all the schooling and all the college. You can do a lot of things through IGNU, open universities, which can give you a piece of paper and you can take it. But uh, I think, um, you know, uh, when you're talking about, uh, you know, some doing something different, you also need to slightly challenge the way in which mo the mainstream is working, you know. It is highly professional, highly competitive, highly based on, you know, 
Um, a lot of it is also, you know, based on contacts and stuff. So, I mean, if you really want to put your child through all these things, I believe that when you're challenging degrees, you're also challenging the larger system. And it's good to do that. But there are so many people who are thinking outside that. So, uh, like I know of so many filmmakers who don't have a degree in filmmaking, but are making the best films, you know, who learned filmmaking from different filmmakers and who didn't go to a formal institution to learn, but who learned through internships or who learned through workshops and who learned through actually just assisting filmmakers in filmmaking. And they're doing great, amazing films right now. So filmmaking is a very, uh, you know, very fertile ground for people to learn without degrees. You don't need a degree. I mean, people, you would see that most of the good filmmakers are actually walkouts from film school. Uh, then there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, cooking professionals. You know, you can, people are opening up amazing cafes, amazing food schools, slow food. So when you say alternative, it's also, you know, thinking about what the impact of your profession is on the, uh, larger system you know if you're going to be cooking you just want a degree to be a mainstream chef that's not the point you to be alternative you need to be creative you need to think about what the impact of your food is around so for that there are tons of places i can connect you with amazing slow food chefs all over the country who will be happy to share their skills without you know having a degree or so yeah i mean i if that helps you i'm happy to share that links all those links with you and we can also talk. Thank about you. Thank you. Because, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Because my daughter is interested in history. She wants to become a historian. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> she's been holding on to it for the couple of, and she's 11 years old. And, uh, but, you know, since uh, three years, she's been very much interested in history and wanting to write a book, yeah. uh, you know, about history. And, you know, so I really want to explore that opportunity. And I, uh, want to, uh, you know, give her more opportunities to, uh, uh, for her as an internship or an apprentice where she could go around, you know, um, more deeper into this field yeah. and, you know, gain some expertise according to her uh, uh, liking. Yeah, I mean, I have a friend who is very excited about history and old buildings and monuments and getting to know, you know, the place and how you connect it deeply, you know, from generations, how people have lived in that space. And actually they're doing amazing work because now they've become alternative guides to that place. And they explain history very differently. So there are so many different ways of understanding history. So they went and actually spent time with, you know, all the people who tried to understand history. And now they've created their own, uh, you know, company, which helps every every you know city uh, you know un unfold their historical you know frameworks and how they would understand the city differently if they were looking at it historically. So I could connect you with you know people who are working on historical things also, for sure. Yeah. So so what's also to to share that it's not only history. I think any any area uh, and the people who are listening, any area when your child is interested, I guess um, um, we need to go beyond what is uh, uh, you know immediately available to us. Possibly the degrees and schools are all around us, and that's what. And then then we feel that that's the that's the end of the world. But when you remove all those layers, then you see that there are so many so 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 many different opportunities so many people who are working on it and there's so many ways which we can and that's what i guess vidhi was talking about there are millions of streams why why do we talk about one stream uh, if a child is interested in history then why are we only thinking about the degree why are we not thinking about many different forms of uh, getting the education um hope hope Atsa, that gives you some kind of a perspective into how how you can take forward what your daughter is interested in um Jane Anjali are asking uh, how do you manage to discipline your child and schedule routine at home assuming a child is not going to school and uh, you know at home so how, how do you manage to mm. yeah so it's it's six uh, uh, vidhi are you okay to little extend and there are a couple of more questions uh, sure maybe five ten more minutes i'm sure. happy yeah sure. ten minutes is good yeah. yeah i do have to run because manish needs medication in his eyes but ten oh, minutes is good oh, yeah. Oh, oh. yeah yeah yeah. So, so we can. So the question is around uh, schedule and discipline. Yeah. Structure. Yeah. 
well, that's an interesting question because, um, you know, uh, all the lessons about schedule, structure, discipline, I've learned from my daughter. <laughs> Uh, because I grew up in a very structured, very disciplined, very, uh, I would say, you know, the whole day was laid out for me every time when I was growing up. And, you know, there was a time for eating, there was a time for sleeping, there was a time for, uh, you know, reading, there was a time. And I used to always struggle with that because it was a very artificial, for me, it was something that was always pushed onto me. I used to hate the timetable in school also because. You never are allowed to do what you want to do for a long time. I mean, my daughter has taught me that, you know, if you want to learn something or if you're passionate about something, you don't need to, you don't need a structure for that. You don't need a time frame for that. You can actually learn it for hours and you need that kind of time for that. So like my daughter, uh, you know, learned is an artist and she, from a very early age, uh, you know, used to, if she wanted to do art, she would start doing it at seven in the morning and she could do it till seven in the evening. And she knew when she was hungry, she would ask for food. When she wanted to step out, she would step out. When she wanted to step in again, she would step in. So all these questions of, you know, structure, discipline are something that we as parents are always grappling around. I haven't actually ever seen a child worried about these things. Mm -hmm. um, children have their own flow of things and as parents we need to let go of all these structures and disciplines I mean I now that I don't have that formal structure in my life mm -hmm. I'm so much more you know in tune with myself and what's going on around me if I was always told that oh this is this is a structure that you have to follow and you need to go back meet so and so I, I actually now dread it because this was always created by someone else for you. So something that we really work on together is actually as a family, uh, you know, we sit down and uh, uh, decide. We don't sit down every day, but maybe once in three, four days, two, three days, we actually decide what we like to do together or what we would like to do on our own and how much time we feel, you know, tentatively we need to give the things that we're doing. And I think that really helps you plan your life. I'm not saying that we follow that structure ever or we follow that discipline ever, but we are at least in sync with what's going on around us. Like my friend, my daughter, we never had a television in our house when she was growing up. But I knew that, you know, she will definitely at some point say, I want to watch TV. So we said, yeah, we, you want to watch TV, you can go. We can get you a television. Then she only said, no, I don't need television. I'll go and see. And we realized that whenever she went to a friend's house, she was watching television for one hour. So that was her fill of television. So she would say, no, at home, I want to do something else. So we created, we, we, we would have discussions, conversations. And a lot of the things got decided with us, um, you know, uh, as a family, I don't think that there could be one structure of when you wake up. I mean, th there were times when as a family, we watched films all night. So there was obviously no way we would wake up early in the morning. But things used to be, you know, there has to be a lot of, uh, you know, conversation and dialogue. And I think um, struck discipline is something that has to come from within. You cannot impose. No matter what you do, after your child hits maybe 15, 10, 15, your kids will not be listening to you. I think that's a reality check that every family needs to get. So no matter how much you try to structure your child, how much you try to discipline your child, it's not going to work. And I think it didn't work. It never worked for us also. We had our own ways of fighting or resisting that discipline. So we have to give that space to our kids also. They will demand a certain kind of structure and we have to have constant conversations about it and i think uh, you know discipline structure these are things that worry the parents more they don't worry the kids and as parents we need to unlearn a lot of this so i don't know if this helps you but it's a lot more again trust in your children's uh, uh, you know way of learning also you when you start doing something you have to let your child also tell you when they're not, you know, happy with it. And so that relationship has to be a much more trusting relationship where 
you are free to tell somebody when this is something maybe it's going overboard but it's fine i respect you for what you're doing maybe you need to you know we can think about it more next time so these are things that need to be constantly discussed at the family i don't think the school discipline is any way a discipline it's a very very externally driven discipline which actually makes you just you know uh, i don't know it, it it just controls your life so much yeah. that you actually if you come out of any structured environment then you find it very difficult to live so you have to understand that this is trap of discipline is also something that we need to constantly question is that helpful <laughs> if you're dead uh, still jane and lee you can respond uh, we'll take two more quick questions uh, uh, vidhi uh, yeah it summed up pretty much <laughs> Yeah. divya is uh, so, sorry preeti is asking how do you take a gap year as a family so the finances are taken care and mm -hmm. you can explore as a family uh, you want to answer now viti or maybe preeti can sure, connect sure i would i am happy because as a family if you are taking a gap year i mean like you know a lot of times finances is considered a, a big constraint but you know when i tell people you know how we work i mean we've never had the cost of a school so that takes away a big cost in our lives so we actually use that money for so many more interesting things but um, you know uh, in this gap year submit that we did and i can if you have if you want i can actually share um, uh, some links of families that took gap years together where they traveled where they started projects together uh, money actually we did a whole session a workshop on how you can travel with zero budget or with very little money so there are many platforms out there that support people you know to travel to go and volunteer in different places to learn different skills so there's a lot of uh, amazing stuff as a family that you can do with a gap year also you know some challenges as a family that you can take together while you're on a gap year so um i i didn't share it but you know a lot of our work in shikshantar is based on this whole idea of gift culture also and uh, we truly believe that you know for a real learning process you don't need tons of money actually uh, it a lot of the learning can happen through trust through good relationships through you know trusting relationships that you have Uh, most of the learning that you do in an institution is only you know if you have to learn something you need to pay 5 lakhs or 4 lakhs or 2 lakhs but uh, you cannot put that value when you're traveling you're actually learning so much more you would not only learn one skill but you're learning so many more skills so the monetary value while learning while traveling practically is very different from what you would learn in, in an institute so um i'm happy to connect you with uh, families who took gap years with very little money you know and how they uh, you know did uh, workshops and how they you know spent time in different spaces i i don't know if you're talking about traveling or just being in one place also there's so many more local resources that you could use which are not just money based but are you know based more on goodwill and hospitality and care and Uh, skills also a lot of people you know um, are happy to skill ch scale their skills without money uh, when you go in, into an internship relationship with anyone they are very happy that you can go and help in lots of different things and uh, you help people set up a new space so they're looking for exciting families so i'm happy to connect you with uh, uh, families who took gap years with very little money and they actually spent money on things that they really wanted to so yeah is that helpful <laughs> preeti if you are there uh, meena is asking how our yeah. children handle the thin line between individuality and ego yeah it's it's a it's a tough question i mean i as a parent would ask myself that question first you know that uh, how, how uh, are what are most of the things are we doing that on the basis of individuality or identity or ego or is it uh, how many of the decisions that we are making today are on you know something that really is coming from the gut or is it more you know coming from some larger framework that we are a part of so i mean i don't i cannot even answer it for a child because i think 
the way we grew up and the way our children are growing up is din raat ka farak hai i mean sometimes i realize that their reality is very different from ours so to be able to put myself in their shoes is challenging for me you know there are lots of things that they do so differently from the way i would do it that i don't even know how they are doing it but um but you know i feel that there is something that's really um you know important that we try to understand that when you're learning something uh, or if, the, if there is a learning process i mean what is it that is driving that learning process is it something if you're doing something with a purpose if you're doing something with you know uh, a context i think the learning is much more authentic and it's not based on ego it's it's much more based on a larger deeper connection with where you are how you connect with the people around you so today i feel that a lot of the learning that's happening in school is very egoistic because it's highly competitive and highly uh, oriented towards a certain goal that's very small but when you start looking at the larger uh, society like if i were to learn farming i mean i i can't learn farming by you know competing with the farmers around me i need to learn by Uh, you know collaborating by making mistakes by practically using my body so a lot of humility comes in when you do those kinds of things so i feel hands on learning and practical learning actually takes away a lot of the ego and uh, and individuality i mean everyone does want to have an individuality but there is a context nobody can actually keep going on that way so um, most of the processes that we would work on are actually how you can work more with more people and more people of all ages because the, the level of learning is very different i feel that when you're learning from a textbook it's very out here only there is no soul there is no heart that goes into it so the more you bring in all your senses in a learning process the more you bring your own body into that learning process the more genuine and authentic that learning process is and i sometimes i'm very honest i find it very difficult when a child is sitting in front of a computer all day i feel that's a very individualistic very egoistic way of learning because you're only consuming you're only taking 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 so uh, today when you see a child sitting on a laptop or sitting on a phone all day you find wow this child is becoming so like self centered so this but but that's how it is and we need to actually help a child if you use that technology or that something in something more creative a creative process cannot be very egoistic it's 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 something that would involve more people more communities more hands on work so um, my daughter i used to find it i used to as a, as a parent used to find it very frustrating if she would sit in front of the television all day or if she would sit in front of her you know though she doesn't play games but if she would be surfing all day i would find it very irritating and then i realized that when she is doing baking she is a totally different person so there are phases when a child will be very individualistic and very egoistic but there are also moments where there is so much caring sharing community that i think there is a balance and that balance we have to appreciate as parents so how do we encourage different kinds of learning experiences is where i feel the strength has to be i, I hope that helps and i the other thing that i very very um as a parent really feel is a very important thing in supporting a child learning process if you're talking only about children is the presence of three generations in learning you know if you have grandparents and if you have young kids and if you have people of our age learning together there is much much less chance of a learning process being you know just uh, you know the way it is in schools today there is much more space for you know conversations for mutual learning for sharing for respect because i feel today the learning whole learning process is lacking respect we don't respect the teachers we don't respect our gurus because they look like you know somebody is always forcing something well natural learning happens when you're living together and people of all generations come together and share their knowledge and kids also get to share their knowledge with them so there's a mutual learning experience going on is that helpful thank thanks thanks a lot uh, vidhi there are uh, thank you <laughs> thanks
There are three more questions with uh, Lipika and Vatsa. If you're fine, I can uh, share uh, Vidhi's number with, with all of you, uh, I, I guess. Or, or Vidhi, if you're fine, I, I'm not sure where are you placed right uh, Yeah, now. sure. I can answer two more. What, where is the question? Okay, then I can, I can read it for you. Uh, Lipika is saying, uh, can you share initial journey of Shikshanta, taking up the village and how you went around creating it? How mm -hmm. long did it take for people to trust and come along with you? Yeah, that's a long one. But I mean, I'll just tell you that when we went to Udaipur for the first time, you know, both me and Manish knew nothing about Udaipur. We had always dreamt of living in Udaipur. We had this really beautiful romantic vision of it being the most romantic, the most beautiful city. And so we actually started from scratch. We knew just a few people who lived in Udaipur, which were, you know, some people we admired, some Gandhians and some... Um, you know, uh, you know, family, friends, but we didn't know that many people. So I think that was a more adventurous and more beautiful journey. When you go to a place and you don't know anything you're going to do. And also going with the flow of uncertainty. We had no idea what we were going to do. So I think the first two, two years, two, three years, we just went out and we used to go and meet people and invite people to Shikshantar. So there were people like, you know, artists, artisans, people who work with their hands, healers. And what I call it is we actually for maybe two, three years, we just did a treasure hunt of Udaipur, just going and creating a learning web for ourselves. So we knew we had actually mapped the city properly. And Udaipur is not a very big city, but it's a very, you know, diverse uh, set of experiences. You all have the rural and the urban Thing going on it's very beautiful it's full of lakes so we actually did a beautiful mapping of the whole city and we found out that this is this area where you have all the artisans living this is an area where you have more uh, you know filmmaker this is the area where you have more halwais living this is where the artists the jewelry makers are and we actually did a mapping and we went and met a lot of people and we said that we are starting something and we would like to invite you into this learning journey and just going with this humility that, you know, you are open to learning. You're not there to teach anyone anything. You're not there to tell people how to do things because a lot of organizations, you know, go with answers. And we were going with just this question that how can we learn more from these amazing people who are around us? And then gradually, you know, once we had a list of a hundred very interesting people, Halwais and uh, you know, people who do alternative media and people who do farming on their rooftops and people who work with animals, we actually started inviting them to do workshops with us. So even if it was a group of five children or 10 children or two families or five families, we would do workshops with them. And that actually gave them an idea. We realized that they were actually so open to sharing their knowledge. And we would also go to different neighborhoods and try different experiments. So we would do rooftop farming with families. We would go and do, uh, you know, kitchen gardens with families. We would do this thing called slow food, eat grub parties. We would invite people to cook together, uh, do nature walks together. So a lot of things happened in the first few years. And we, the first two years to three years were actually just to create an amazing network of people for us. And to actually follow our own paths. Like I realized I was very interested in natural colors and natural dyeing and fabrics. So I would, I would actually go and look for them. And it's, it's really beautiful because if it's, you live in a beautiful city, you realize so many more beautiful things when you start exploring the city. So that's how we started Chikshantar. We just went out and started spending time with people of different ages, different backgrounds. Uh, and, and, that's how you got deeply connected with people. And so now what happened was then gradually when my daughter was born and when she really wanted to go and learn certain aspects of art, I knew where she could go and learn. And I already had a good relationship with those people. And it's not only for my child, but I know that if any young person comes to Shikshantar with an interest in a certain area, I know where to send that person. Because we have an amazing relationship with those people and they would never say no. Then once you know that this person is interested in something, then we would invite them to do internships with them or stuff like that. So it was a beautiful, you know, for us, it was a learning experience to just be around so many creative people all of a sudden. And I think that is possible anywhere you go.
just do a good treasure hunt. If you want, I can actually send you a, a list of at least you know, like 30, 40 amazing different kinds of things you can go and do a treasure hunt around. And kids love doing it. Old people love doing it. So you can involve more people in doing that and invite them to do different things together. So Udaipur as a learning city and Chikshantar really unfolded like that. And we realized that we were actually living in a very strong community, a very strong village. Vatsa mm. uh, is asking, is the gap year you're talking about mainstream schoolers who wants to take a gap year before joining college or university or? Yeah, yeah, a lot of mainstream schoolers, yes. People who took gap year in class nine, people are taking gap years in, uh, after um, class 12. The, uh, we know of people who've taken gap years after class seven. The thing is that a lot of new pe people who take gap years never want to go back to school. But, um, um, but you know, yeah, all mainstream schools. So we, if you want, I can share stories of people who took gap years in mainstream schools and are gone back to school also and how they dealt with the school authorities. And just, I just want to tell you that this new education policy that's come out, I mean, I don't know how helpful it is, but it has a lot of emphasis on people being flexible in their education. So gap year is something that they are encouraging. It's not something that says, no, you cannot leave school or come back to school. It's, there is a larger amount of flexibility in this new education policy for people who are in mainstream schools also and who want to leave college or who want to join college also. So uh, Lipika is requesting to share the treasure hunt. Sure. <laughs> yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. And I think Meena has summed up for uh, all of us uh, that thanks Vidhi, your positive perspective on thing is amazing. And thanks for sharing with all of us. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I, I would love to know more about all the people who are here too. So yeah so i can actually type in my uh, email yeah. address if anyone would like contact me or stay in touch or even my number if anyone wants to contact me i'm very happy to be in touch with people and invite everyone to udaipur once yeah. things open up and spend time with us yeah yeah yeah, yeah. thank you so i'll type it here my no, no, that would be wonderful Vidhi. And you I want the phone number as well or just the e uh, email is whatever fine. you can whatever you can. i can put both yeah then you that would be wonderful for people to connect directly with you great um, yeah and to... i'm always accessible we have a very good website in chikshantar so. Yeah, I think uh, Divya, she just left. She said she's already browsed through the uh, website. Okay, great. Yeah, so I'll just send my um, email and my phone number for anyone who wants to get in touch. Yeah. And great. anything you want to sum up this whole uh, uh, space uh, with your, any, any ending thought, uh, uh, Vidhi? No, I'm really excited that, I mean, I would love to know more about the people who are here also, because it really gives me, you know, when I could connect with everyone who's here personally, it really helps me. So, but I would love to stay in touch and I'm happy. And uh, Arohi is amazing anyway. In, uh, are these all people here from Bangalore or from many places? From different places, uh, uh, whosoever are either no Arohi or have got connected to different networks. Yeah. So we've had so many kids from Arohi come to Shikshanta, to our <laughs> camps, to Swaraj, to so yeah, many I, different gatherings that it's already a school. My Swaraj, uh, so. <laughs> huh? uh, Sorry, uh, oh, my own daughter was in Swaraj. So we yeah, had yeah, I know, of course. <laughs> yeah. We're just talking about it today. <laughs> Great. No, I'm very happy. And I feel that this lockdown is actually opened up more possibilities yeah. for all of us. Yeah. You know, people feel very scared, very anxious, very, you know, as to what's going to happen. The fear, unlearning this fear of the lockdown is also very important because, uh, you know, this is something that's going to go on. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, time for us to actually rethink how we want to live as families, how we want to live as um, you know, communities and how do we want to redefine education, learning in our lives. So, I mean, 
I think this lockdown and COVID happened for a reason. And I take it as an invitation for all of us to, you know, deeply connect more with each other about questions of learning, lifestyle, and, uh, you know, how we want to grow together. So I'm happy that this happened. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot.